Hello and welcome back to another Questions Fair session. My name is Heska and I'm reporting to you live from the Lighthouse. I'm so excited that you're here with us. We are halfway through an incredible day. We've already been flying across the galaxy, um, starting uh, with the digital economy this morning, then economic visions. We've just touched on the innovation theme, but next up we are headed to a constellation to discuss the role of economists. I'm so excited you're here for that, and I want to emphasize you actually can participate real time directly into this session. And if you're new, if this is your first session you're tuning into, here's a little video about how that works. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question and each group of stars or constellation contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, Think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. All right, so I hope you're ready and follow me into the constellation. For that, I'm going to hand the floor to Magali Brosio. Let me ask you this, what is an economist? An abstract observer of markets and process? Charting their disasters and prosperous progress? Are they just math nerds or August philosophers? It may not be obvious even if you're an economist Just what the object of being an economist is Starting with this, are you neutral observers Or are you in the business of customer service? And if you are, is the customer the public Or persons with personal wealth with the strings to the person? Is it a natural science of observable facts? Or a social science that creates and refracts within in the cultural prison do its promises and pacts represent the general welfare or political pacts that's the question and as it gets renewed there's no one who can give it a good answer until we do it even if we don't yet all agree on what they're doing at least we can agree economists are human hello everyone welcome uh, my name is Magali Rossio. I'm one of the coordinators of the Gender and Economics Working Group here at YSI, and today I am your question moderator for this session. Uh, in order to guide our future research, the right questions might first be asked, and this is why we're all here today, to settle on the questions that would lead future YSI collective work. As Kask explained in the video, the first part of the session works as a collaborative question incubator. In the graph, you will already see questions that were submitted directly by the speaker in relation to the presentation you are about to listen to. While Shuli Nelson is talking, you will be muted on the Zoom call, but you are all invited and encouraged to go to the platform and suggest new questions or like questions suggested by others in relation to the talk. After the talk is, en is ended, we welcome you again to this Zoom to discuss together how can we further improve the questions and which are the most pertinent questions of our time. Without further ado, I want to hand it over to Ricardo Salas in order to introduce our speaker.
Play of the YSA Plenary, New Economic Questions. Welcome to the Role of Economics Constellation 2. My name is Ricardo Salas, and I will be today your moderator in this amazing talk with Julie Nelson. I'm a third year economic student of the P, uh, of the uh, of UMS Amherst, and I'm very pleased, excited, and also a little bit afraid of having with me Julie Nelson. Julie Nelson is a fantastic economist, and I'm a very uh, big fan of her work. She, she is a professor emeritus of the University of Massachusetts at Boston. The, she's also a senior research fellow at Tufts University in the Global Development and Environment Institute. And her research has been on feminist economics, ecological economics, ethics, ethics and economics, and the teaching of economics. For today's purpose, I will address some of the questions that she has helped us to shape. And obviously, this is our, my interpretation. So if you can have all the interpretation, you are welcome to. She has been focused on how binarism and sexist cultural habits makes economics wrong, how these can get up to environment fails, and how these will help us to widen the gaps between male and females. She stressed out why self-interest, the theory of utility, and the maximization in economics had led us as humankind to tolerate and even praise the greed and the opportunism of people, something that is very important in our days, seeing our politicians, seeing the people who are leading us in the world. And also, she even has... work on how good things the mainstream economics. So I will lead you with Julie. Is it over to uh, me? Ah, okay, thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. It's an honor to, uh, to be invited. Um, I thought I'd start by just uh, sharing with you the three questions I sent in, and they all fit within what I think of as a broader questions and bigger toolbox approach to economics. Uh, broader questions meaning the questions that really have impact on um, uh, our human species and our, our, our planet and how we get along with each other. Um, if you're going to spend time on something, um, you might as well do it on something important. It's going to take just as long to do the research project on something critically important as to do on, on something trivial. So, so choose a, a, a really good question. Um, and the bigger toolbox is uh, getting beyond some biases that have been uh, built into the mainstream of economics. Uh, so the three questions I'd sent in, uh, number one is, with the era of resource plundering coming to an end, how can we make, make economies, economies environmentally sustainable? Second one, recognizing the biases implicit in mainstream economic thought, how can we build a better discipline of economics? And thirdly, how do we make economics and economies truly inclusive? So the first one, with the era of resource plundering coming to an end, how can we make economies environmentally sustainable? Um, as I just glanced over topics in the plenary, I didn't see uh, very much on this one, um, which surprised me. Uh, as I'm sure you know, um, climate change has been uh, uh, moving faster uh, than scientists were predicting uh, even a few years ago. Uh, I remember a decade or so ago, I used to think, you know, I've got to work on this for the sake of my grandchildren. <laughs> now it's not just my grandchildren, it's, uh, you know, children and, uh, and us uh, currently uh, alive are being affected by this. Um, our time of being able to ignore the, the role of the environment as a source of resources and as a sink for waste products um, is gone. Uh, uh, lots of changes coming up. Um, if we want to continue to survive and flourish, uh, we need to reorient our relationship uh, to the environment. 
I've done most of my work in uh, feminist economics, um, but when you think about it, the environment and women's uh, traditional work got pretty much the same treatment. Uh, in the within the mainstream, uh, both women's caring labor, bringing up children, taking care of the sick, uh, and resources from the environment were basically just assumed to arise uh, freely and without end. Um, uh, they don't. Uh, they actually uh, have limits, uh, and they actually are costly uh, uh, to provide. So it's time to to face up to that and look into where those come from. Um, in the uh, economics and context textbooks that I worked on, um, we added to the three basic economic activities of production, uh, distribution, and consumption that are in every textbook, a prior one, resource maintenance. Uh, how can you start to do the other ones unless you've taken care of your, your resource base? Uh, what would this mean in terms of um, actual things to do on research? Well, one is um, reorienting our discipline away from its focus on uh, GDP growth, on consumerism, and on narrow definitions of uh, efficiency. Uh, we also need to take global equity issues into account. There have, of course, been economists working on climate change. Unfortunately, a lot of the mainstream work has uh, put it in a marginalist framework, um, uh, assuming that we know a lot more uh, assuming that GDP will continue to grow forever, uh, assuming we don't really have to worry about global equity issues, um, and discounting away the future. And this is how you get these kind of slow ramping up responses. Uh, but even some people who advocated that uh, are now saying we have to move uh, much uh, faster. Um, that kind of uh, uh, modeling um, may have some uses, but a lot of those uses have so far been, uh, been pretty bad. Uh, I think um, in terms of advising people what uh, they can do on these issues, a lot of it, um, I think a lot of ec uh, economics is a lot more useful on smaller scales. Um, what sort of measures um, of well-being can we put together that are not uh, just GDP growth? We really want to look at resilience and well-being, uh, not GDP growth uh, and efficiency uh, at this point. Uh, there's a lot of sort of micro-level stuff, cost-effectiveness analysis of um, particular investments. Uh, should a town go through for solar or wind? Uh, that's the kind of thing where a lot of uh, economic analysis uh, could come in. On the other hand, we need to be um, aware that, at least in the United States, uh, a strong preference for cost-benefit analysis has actually um, been used as a stalling tactic uh, to keep environmental regulations from happening. So that needs to be uh, guarded against. Uh, and really in any sort of economics, whatever field you're in, um, you know, certainly in, in macro, uh, because of the, the, the focus on GDP that really needs changing. Uh, but if you're doing consumer or you're looking at supply chains, looking at labor issues, uh, all of these have um, environmental and climate change aspects. And we really need to shift um, our focus onto what will uh, provide uh, survival and flourishing. The second question I had proposed was recognizing uh, the biases implicit in mainstream economic thought. How can we build a better discipline of economics? And actually kind of a, a secondary aspect on that, building on uh, Ricardo's introduction, how can we keep uh, uh, the uh, rather inadequate sort of economics we've been doing from having such a negative effect on the world, <laughs> which I believe it has had. Uh, so that we have a uh, in the mainstream, um, we have a fairly antiquated model of uh, science. And I, I learned about this not by becoming a critic, but by training as a mainstream uh, neoclassical economist. And basically, I've done sort of a lifelong ethnography, participant observation ethnography of the profession. So economists are very proud that we are uh, more rigorous uh, than people like those sociologists uh, uh, over there who do that soft stuff like talk to people, um, when rigor gets uh, defined as, as mathematics. So we have an antiquated model of science, really based on a Newtonian physics sort of frame of mind. Uh, we pretend to be value-free. We pretend that markets uh, just self-exist outside of society and the environment. 
um, we take a very one-sided view of how humans um, behave. Uh, we have this economic agent who is rational, autonomous, self-interested, uh, and reacts uh, or uh, interacts with other people only through uh, arm's length uh, competition. Uh, totally ignoring the fact that we are also emotional beings, interdependent, uh, are interested in uh, people other than ourselves, uh, and cooperative. And this isn't uh, uh, this kind of cooperation and uh, other interest isn't always nice. I mean, sometimes we think of this as the harsh versus the nice. Um, but elites cooperating among themselves, uh, uh, backing each other up to cooperate to uh, keep down people who are not elite. <laughs> that is actually cooperation, uh, and that is uh, is other interest. So this isn't just nice versus not nice. This is a fuller picture of how humans uh, behave. And of course. In uh, my feminist economic writing, I pointed out the gender associations of this uh, rational uh, autonomous agent as uh, uh, a picture of uh, an idealized and never really existing masculinity and all of the rejected things, emotion, interdependence, etc., cooperation, uh, being part of a, a disdained uh, femininity. And I need to clarify here, this isn't that men are one way and women are the other, we are all both. Uh, but our gendered ways of thinking uh, have bifurcated the world in this very unhealthy uh, and unhelpful way. So the mainstream has tended to limit the methods to uh, certain dogmas uh, about utility and profit maximization, uh, etc., uh, and uh, uh, ever more sophisticated mathematics. And it's not that mathematics and models are, are bad, but the hegemony uh, that says this is the only way to do economic research, uh, cuts off uh, not only a lot of ways of analyzing things, but a lot of, of subject matter. Uh, I think most people in the world think of uh, the economy as the way they get their livelihood. Uh, and yet we cut off so much of the richness of what goes on in economic life by trying to fit it into these narrow models. A much better view of science, uh, getting out of this old Newtonian physics, you know, math and calculus are our science idea, is to think of science as open-minded, systematic inquiry. Uh, open-minded meaning we can think of other sorts of theories of the firm, other sorts of theories of the consumer. You know, oh, really, there's other possibilities out there. Uh, open-minded, systematic inquiry. Uh, we may not ever be able to get to full objectivity, uh, full truth uh, everyone can agree on. We can, however, aspire to reliable knowledge. And the way to get reliable knowledge is not to follow some uh, particular formula, um, but to take the results of your research and present it to uh, communities that could be critical and expand uh, the community of people uh, uh, being able to comment uh, and point out biases in your research. Uh, as wide as you can make that community. So critique from an expanded community of scholars, expanded community, um, is the uh, real way to find out whether your research is reliable. Um, as the introduction said, uh, economists are human. Uh, humans tend to have uh, certain kinds of biases built in uh, that we don't see. Um, uh, we don't see our biases until we're confronted by someone uh, who does not share them. These can be individual biases, but they can also be social, cultural, uh, national biases. So we really need that community of, of critics. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of the way that um, our methodology uh, models have gone wrong and um, had bad effects uh, on the world. Um, Take the theory of the firm as a theoretical example. Uh, we have assumed that firms maximize profits, uh, that people leading firms are self-interested, uh, rational uh, maximizers. And this, unfortunately, has become performative in the world in a very negative way. Uh, Jensen and Meckling's famous uh, article on the theory of the firm um, said that we need, uh, we, you can't trust a, a chief executive officer uh, to run the business well, right? Uh, because they're self-interested and you can, oh, you must incentivize them uh, to run the firm well and well being taken as in the interest of the shareholders, which is also not true, but that's another uh, talk. Um, but you have to incentivize CEOs by giving them stock options, giving them more money in order to get them to act in the interest of somebody else, in that case, the shareholders. 
Um, so we've ruled out the fact that people might actually do their job well because they're paid well. They might actually be interested in the firm as a creative uh, organization, as an organization that creates employment, as an organization that creates a quality product. We've narrowed down that person into someone who's only interested in their own compensation. And that really does an injustice uh, to people to narrow them that way. But we have this bifurcated view. Well, we concentrated on rationality, individuality, self-interest in market realms. Um, we buried this uh, emotional interdependent uh, realm uh, over in kind of women's side. Those things that women do, uh, those can be that way. So there's actually also articles, at least two articles, um, published in respectable economics journals that make the opposite argument to uh, Jensen and Mecklings about CEOs for the case of nurses. Uh, nurses are, uh, take care of people who are ill. The arguments in these articles go that the way to get the best nurses is not to incentivize them uh, to do good care, uh, but to pay them less. Because if you pay less, that's what the way you make sure only altruists take the job. Um, now, why don't we see an argument that you should pay CEOs less uh, so that way only altruists uh, would take the job? Why don't we see arguments that you should incentivize uh, nurses uh, by paying them more? We have this whole bifurcated view. It does not allow CEOs to be human. It does not allow uh, nurses to have uh, families to feed. Uh, it's just crazy. Uh, but it comes from this bifurcated view of what humanity is. Um, and that, that uh, stock options to CEOs is, is what's uh, really behind that, that charge of the top fraction of 1% in the U.S. pulling the inequality um, uh, situation uh, so wildly uh, away from what it's been before. So we need to critique um, biases in our theory, uh, need to look out to use all useful tools um, there's a journal, Journal of Economic Methodology, looks at uh, methodology issues. There's a lot of writing in feminist economics about uh, uh, methodology. A lot of work in ecological economics about better sorts of theories uh, that could be put up, uh, 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 theoretical frameworks uh, in which to look at environmental problems. Um, uh, I've also worked, in, uh, consider myself a, a social economist. Um, there's work there on broadening our, our methodological toolbox. Uh, and I also take inspiration from what's uh, known as old institutional economics, uh, looks at the um, real structures and, uh, uh, and uh, beliefs in institutions, uh, not just some uh, black box of, of maximizing uh, agents. A second part of this um, point on methodology is about empirical work. Um, I have heard, uh, I believe there's other uh, uh, discussions going on around YSI about things like p-hacking and the replication uh, crisis. Um, this is really, uh, and if, if you're not familiar with that, you, you, you should be, uh, and, and soon. Uh, basically, our, uh, the sort of um, econometrics I learned as a graduate student and did myself was you um, do your research, and if you get uh, p-values of less than 0.05, you have a publishable paper. Uh, and if you don't, you better get back there and play around with your data until you do. <laughs> uh, that's not exactly what's taught, but it's certainly what's, uh, what's demonstrated. Um, some lip service given to uh, the more rigorous requirements of actual statistical testing. Um, but a number of, of pieces in economics have shown that this is what is actually done, uh, that there's a whole cluster of um, findings around p equals 0.05, much better than you can statistically demonstrate. And some of my own research um, has also uh, uh, shown evidence of um, uh, uh, p-hacking. Um, and it, we, we got into this, uh, you know, it, it very, uh, p equals 0.05 has, has no magical power. We act as if p equals 0.04999 is very different from p equals 0.5001, uh, and that's just silly. Uh, but I think it goes back to this idea that we want to be like physicists, these hard scientists, we want, need to have a rule where we can decide this way or that way. And, and that's not the way the world works. Uh, and that's not the way current science works, okay? We're, we're still stuck in this Newtonian uh, mode of, of looking for certainty. We really need, again, to take, care, take um, uh, account of this social nature of knowledge, uh, that we actually come to reliable knowledge by uh, critiquing each other, okay? And this is where um, replication comes in. 
See if somebody else can get the same results. This is where pre-registering comes in. Okay, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tell the world what I do, what I plan on, so I can't fudge around with it later. This is about putting social bounds and social critique uh, on what we do. Um, so I hope, uh, again, speaking to, to younger scholars here, that in your career, um, uh, you won't just focus on making a career. You'll actually focus on making knowledge. <laughs> and unfortunately, these days, those aren't necessarily the same thing. To actually make quality knowledge, you need to pay attention uh, to these kinds of developments uh, going on uh, in empirical uh, methodology. And you need to use them, um, use them well. And here I have to, I was going to give a, a, a plug for a, a, a session, um, but it happened before this, so now I have to plug it in, in retrospect. Um, but some of my own work on this, I said, uh, illustrated um, p-hacking and also confirmation bias. I spent um, a number of years recently looking into uh, the behavioral economics literature on uh, gender differences in preferences. Uh, and there's the statement all over the place, uh, women are more risk averse than men supposedly backed up by um, scientific, rigorous, uh, empirical work. Uh, turns out it's mostly made up. Um, people have confirmation bias if they expect uh, to find fundamental differences between the sexes. Uh, that's what they find. Uh, what they actually find, however, is at best uh, a, a statistically significant difference that's quite small. Uh, there's a lot of variation among men, a lot of variation among women. A small difference between means, but it means absolutely nothing for what you could say about any male individual or any female individual. Um, also, if you look at the literature and use something called a funnel diagram, you can see that there should be a whole bunch of uh, works finding women taking more risks than men, uh, but they don't get published. So there's, uh, there's ways of looking into uh, p-hacking and publication bias there. Uh, but uh, Veronica Poor, Amelia Brito, and Stephanie Thomas uh, presented a paper uh, earlier uh, where they followed up on the, the research I had done on this to see how many people adopted uh, a better methodology and how many uh, uh, didn't. Um, so there's lots of work to be done in this area. There's still a lot of inertia in the discipline uh, to stay with the old habits. I still get papers to review all the time that seem to have never heard of p-hacking, never heard of this issue. Uh, big open field there for you to do uh, better work. And uh, I've got to get to my third question here, so we have time for, uh, for your questions. My third question, how do we make economics and economies uh, truly inclusive? If you've been paying attention to what's gone on in the American Economic Association um, over the last oh, couple years, I guess, since uh, Alice Wu's undergraduate paper on uh, sexism on the online uh, job market rumors uh, forum, uh, you'll see there's been a waking up to the um, narrowness of the American Economic Association uh, and the uh, economics profession, uh, at least in the U.S., to um, issues of uh, gender, issues of race, uh, uh, religion, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexual preference, sexual identity, uh, all of these things. Um, uh, there has been... Um, a great deal of discrimination and bias and exclusion going on in economics. Uh, the AEA has, has finally started to uh, recognize that, did a, a survey, published a survey, uh, uh, came up with an ethics code, asked people now to agree to that ethics code uh, before participating in things. And that gets added at, at one level. Uh, they're, they're taking steps, they've taken steps to um, to remedy the problems of uh, exclusion at sort of the, the social level, how people interact with each other. Uh, there has been, so far, a profound um, inability to recognize the way that this lack of inclusiveness has also uh, affected the, the definition, um, the models and methods, uh, and the, the topics being studied in economics. So I've already talked about methodology, how this stuff kind of that was considered feminine uh, got banished uh, from economics, uh, but also in terms of, of topics. Um, actually, I was at a YSI uh, 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 conference some years ago where I had an, an interesting uh, uh, dialogue afterwards. Uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz and, uh, and, and Piketty were having a, a dialogue about inequality, and they talked primarily about taxation and higher education changes as a way to address inequality. I uh, 
talk to somebody afterwards and I said, well, you know, um, publicly subsidized high quality child care uh, would also be a great way of um, uh, investing in children, you know, not just higher education, but starting early and also investing in working families, bringing up the bottom of the, 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 the families that are really struggling with child care. And the response I got from someone was, oh, but this wasn't a session about life course issues. Yeah, kids, yeah, kid, kids just don't belong in a serious economic discussion. Um, that's a kind of exclusion of a topic uh, that comes from uh, biases. Uh, people who've had primary responsibility for managing child care probably don't think it's so trivial. Um, uh, poverty issues, discrimination issues, um, issues of concentration of power um, that exclude other folks uh, tend not to be even be seen by people who are in uh, that area of concentrated power. There's a whole invisibility that comes from um, keeping uh, uh, economics uh, exclusive, uh, not only demographically, but also along these uh, methodological, definitional, um, and topic uh, sides. So in terms of, of things uh, to do here, um, you know, whatever your line of research is, uh, make sure to pay attention to the viewpoints of the people who are affected. Uh, we do this so little in economics. Um, if you go into anthropology or sociology, uh, they're much further uh, ahead uh, on this than we are. Um, uh, seek out uh, from those uh, most affected uh, what's uh, uh, going on in your, your studies. Uh, uh, think about doing things like questioning survey categories. You know, are boxes for male and female really enough? Um, or are there uh, things excluded? Uh, should people just be only to check one box, uh, race and ethnicity, right? Um, there are all sorts of ways to, to bring um, a more inclusive scope into any kind of research project. And I encourage you to, um, to investigate those. And uh, that's been uh, 25 minutes by my count, so I'm going to stop and uh, go back to... Um, uh, our questions, uh, Ricardo, or uh, or uh, Magali. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Yuli. Uh, I'm gonna sum up a little bit about this. You just give us an amazing talk about why we need to include the environment on econ programs, why we need to broaden the concept from a world with unlimited growth, from a world in which we are seeing that GDP can grow forever to a world that all resources are limited. How can methods can be do harm, um, very bad harm, not only to the thinking of economics, but to the world instead. We need to move forward Newtonian physics. The idea that we are math, calculative and rational individuals because we are ignoring that we are emotional, cooperative, and social individuals in good ways and in bad ways. In one word, we forgot that we are humans and we are talking to people that instead of do economics of about people, we tend to fit people in very, very specific models that confirm our bias that are based on p hacking on publication bias and confirmation bias and that we need to acknowledge as a collective that we are humans too and we have confirmation bias and that we tend to believe in the things that we have been working on it will be very worried if we were not so we are not rational either and people is not rational. You say it to us that diversity matters. So we are excluding people. We are taking people from the uh, in, out of the room. And also we are invisibilizing topics. People can enter into the room, but only on the topics that we think that fits to these hard times. And also we need to think for to beyond and think who is going to be affected by your policies who is being affected by the single thing that could be a survey, who is being omitted, who is being excluded. So uh, now we have our questions and let's talk about this one. The, I'm gonna remember you on the audience that the main idea is not for you to answer this question, but to talk about it. And the question one is, 
how can we frame a model of development that is more people oriented rather than goods oriented? Um, that would be a wonderful uh, research topic. Yeah. Um, the So a model of development that's more uh, people oriented uh, rather than uh, goods oriented. Uh, you know, the goods orientation or goods and services orientation is you know, what we have with a, a GDP growth uh, centered model. More stuff is good. <laughs> well, actually, more stuff is not always good. Um, And, uh, and this is not to say that some areas do not need more GDP growth. I'm not a, I'm not a, a no, you know, if you're poor, you have to stay poor, um, is, is not the message to get across here. But uh, human well-being um, diverges uh, from uh, simply uh, uh, goods and services. There are goods and services that are, are, are necessary. There are goods and services that increase well-being. Uh, and there are other things that increase well-being uh, that may actually be diminished by too much pursuit of goods and services. Um, uh, family life, personal life, community life, for example, if you're chasing after consumer goods all the time and don't have time, um, those things go downhill. So there are um, some models of, um, of development and, uh, and also just measuring um, how you know, so-called already developed countries um, have well-being. Okay, so uh, uh, things like the, uh, the general progress, uh, the progress indicator, <laughs> I do I have the first word right, uh, I'm, I'm uh, getting these questions on the fly, I don't have uh, uh, notes or a working brain in front of me, but there are you know, there is, uh, you know, various kinds of, um, of indices out there for measuring uh, uh, other dimensions. Um, the human development index, you know, very, you know, very limited. I think it only uses three factors uh, uh, about life expectancy and education or something. But it's, um, but at least they start to move away uh, from GDP uh, as the sole goal. So yeah, um, uh, what are Uh, there are some things that, that look at subjective happiness. Subjective happiness is a little bit dodgy because uh, people who become resigned to their fates may report that they're happy, uh, even when they're in dire straits. So I tend to go more with uh, you know, SIN's capabilities framework about um, whether people have uh, uh, what, um, uh, what they need to be able to um, uh, live the life they choose. Uh, And uh, the, the Human Development Index was sort of based on that idea, and there's been lots of developments, um, uh, similar developments uh, since then. So the idea then is, is not um, just infinitely more goods and services for their own sake, but what goods and services most increase human well-being, uh, which ones don't. Obviously, some things uh, that, that get into GDP uh, don't. Um, Lots of negative expenditures, like you know, prisons and all, get into GDP. Uh, what if you uh, changed the approaches to crime, uh, and uh, and brought that down in different sorts of ways? Um, so there, I mean, there's a lot of work by people uh, in social economics, in uh, uh, ecological economics, thinking about these different ways of trying to uh, uh, envision progress and measure progress. So it's a great topic. Well, we have another one that is great, and is how should we define work? <laughs> uh, interesting. Um, so as a research topic, as a research topic, the first thing you would do is go out and find out how people define work, right? Uh, as a research topic. Uh, and I think you would find um, uh, some interesting variations there and some nuances. Um, I think it would be lovely to take that question a little bit further and say, um, how do people feel about their work? What does work in your life mean to you? Uh, not only what is work, and people will probably come back with some, you know, some stuff about what you do for pay, uh, if they're also doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, work. Uh, in families and communities, they will also uh, mention uh, unpaid uh, work in there. Uh, but we tend to assume in economics that um, you work for pay um, and it's just for the money. Um, people in management and human resources, sociology, other areas know that we work for a lot more than that. Um, we work for all sorts of kinds of social interaction and we work for all sorts of um, uh, other kinds of satisfaction. And this is true not only in professional stuff like this. Obviously, we all like to work with our intellects or we wouldn't be here. Uh, but even in what 
we might think of as, as less skilled work. There are still satisfactions to be had in a job well done. There are still satisfactions to be had in um, uh, uh, working with a good boss, working with good coworkers. So I would love if you know somebody takes that on a, as a research question, um, how do you define work? Also take that that step further to uh, what does work mean to you? Uh, and then what does that mean for how we organize uh, work and how we organize our lives? Well, we have another question and is how to incorporate interdisciplinary into the economic science and how to overcome our methodological constraints. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. So how to incorporate interdisciplinary work and overcome um, methodological constraints. Um, I will put, um, I'll, I'll kind of answer this in two stages. One is, uh, since I know I'm, there's a lot of young scholars out there, is in terms of getting your degree, uh, do what your major professor wants. <laughs> Okay, very, very practical advice. You can't really go on until you have, uh, you know, jumped a few hurdles. Um, my own my own strategy was to do a conventional dissertation. Uh, my first publication was in Econometrica. You know, you, you've got to uh, establish some some credentials. So uh, do what you need to do to get yourself uh, listened to. Uh, but for your life work, you know, d don't let yourself get so. Um, uh, brainwashed in the process of economics training uh, that you fail to get an education <laughs> and that you fail to, to uh, really remember how to think. Uh, and so um, when you are taking on a research project, one way to incorporate interdisciplinary uh, work is to get put together an interdisciplinary team. Uh, economists tend to work alone a lot more than people in a lot of other um, social science and scientific fields. Uh, there's nothing wrong, uh, and actually you could learn a lot by teaming up with a sociologist, an anthropologist, a historian, a philosopher, um, uh, a statistician, of course, but um, you know these other folks in putting your, uh, putting things together. Uh, and you'd be, you, you know, there may be some, some cross critique there too. You may be teaching them something uh, uh, from the economic side, uh, but you can bring, um, bring together a lot of different um, uh, viewpoints that way. In terms of overcoming the methodological um, uh, biases, uh, this is a long haul. Uh, there is a concentrated power structure uh, in economics at, at the US level, at the global level. Um, of people who are probably not going to want things to change. Uh, they're pretty comfortable, they've got good jobs, you know, go for their graduate students who they train to do the same thing that they do. Uh, and they have the editorships of a lot of influential journals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are some, um, uh, some room. I mean, I have seen some innovative papers get published in some of the, the better journals. Um, there has been uh, some work published on things like the you know, p-hacking uh, in uh, Journal of Economic Literature. Uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives um, claims to take a broader perspective on, on things. It's mostly sort of invited articles. And they're broad, you know, goes from here to here. You know, it's not hugely broad, but um, a way of getting some things in. Um, there are a number of uh, field journals and uh, heterodox journals um, uh, which take a broader view. Uh, uh, the Journal of Feminist Economics um, publishes uh, both things that are critical of methodology, uh, standard methodology, and things that absolutely use uh, standard uh, uh, methodologies. Um, uh, review of Social Economics, Forum for Social Economics, um, the uh, journal, uh, the JEI, Institutional Journal, a lot of these other places can be places in which uh, broader methodologies uh, can be used. Um, and, you know, a really good paper um, that there are ways of, of using uh, methodology to simply do things better uh, that should uh, get recognized in these mainstream uh, journals. I've had a couple cases, I uh, did some work on quantity aggregation, technical subject, uh, but cleaning up some methodological aspects of that that got into RE stats and a couple other places some time back. So just, I mean, just doing a good job um, uh, with a broader view uh, uh, can help even in the more um, mainstream places and maybe help move the, move the dime uh, on getting us to, um, to accept uh, these broader uh, uh, facets. 
of, of human behavior and um, our human failings as theoretical and, and empirical researchers. Well, before we move forward, would you like to suggest to us any new question? <laughs> I think I'll uh, I think I'll have my questions at, at that. I've I've had I've I've done plenty of my talking. You, you all need to, to do more talking with each other and uh, and uh, and write me back and tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> right, the larger expanded community. How about you? Well, thank you so much. So our plenary aim is to set a new research agenda for economics to build on the shoulders of those as Julie Nelson has opened a path for those who were absent in the room, for those who didn't have the opportunity to talk, or those who, even if they were on the table, were not able to talk to economists because they were invisible to mainstream economics or to the normal way to do economics. Thank you for your way of thinking and the gift that you give us today, that how to think about future questions. And now we are going to move the conversation to a second part that is about to begin. So we need to move to the studio again. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, Julie, for such wonderful input. We really, really appreciate all the questions that have been raised. They make for a terrific collection, but we're not done yet. So we hope you'll join us to further refine these questions and to help us figure out which ones we're going to be adding into the constellation. Join us for that, and I'm sending it right back. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, Thank you, Hefke, for that introduction. Thank you, Ricardo. And of course, thank you, Shilin Nelson, for that very inspiring talk. Um, as you probably know uh, by now, we're going to do some hands-on work on the questions. Um, we really want to improve them. We already selected three questions that we feel are very relevant for our future research work. But even though great questions can benefit from some uh, refining in order to make them more accurate, more inspiring, so at this point where I'm going to allow a new feature in the platform that is called a new, allow new rephrasings. And what we're going to do is go by one by one through these questions and try to propose new rephrasings that we think um, work better. We can also use Julie's uh, words in order to inspire us. Um, in order to make it more interactive or more fun, in, um, you don't have to listen to my voice through this whole time, um, I would like to invite you to take the floor. For instance, if you want to propose uh, a new rephrasing, uh, you can take uh, the floor and explain why you think certain rephrasing is better than other. Um, you can also, for instance, um, uh, share ideas that you don't know exactly how to put them into your rephrasing, but you have a hint. So if you wish to take the floor, please raise your hand and we'll give you, um, we'll give you the word. So we're going to start all together with working with the first question, which was how can we frame a model of development that is more people oriented rather than good oriented? Anyone is willing to take the floor or propose a new rephrasing on this one? Julie already said that she felt it was a great question, um, that there were many proposals that went beyond uh, traditional goods and services framework. So perhaps we should try one Anyone willing to take the floor and add a few hints on this? Okay. While well, people think, I also would like to tell you that the like feature is still enabled. So when we have a new phrasing, you're also allowed to change your like. So suppose you like the original question, which is good. Uh, but then you see a phrasing that you like better. You can move your like from the original question to the new phrasing. Um, and we might see at the end that the new phrasing actually wins and it's the new question that we thought it's more relevant. So let's go back. We still don't have any phrasing.
Okay, we can start with another one and then go back to that one, if that's possible. So then oh, the next one has some, uh, some suggestions already. So we're gonna work on the question that says, how should we define work? So we have different proposals. Uh, what motivates people to work, which is also very much related to what Julian Elson just said. And we also have a different one that says, how people feel about their work and how can people's opinions about their work be incorporated into a broader definition. So you see, you, we have now more refined perhaps versions of the original one. Perhaps any of the authors of this, quest, of this new phrasing would like to take the floor and explain to us what motivated to um, share this on the first place. Well, I think we have Heske raising her hand. I think you have lower hand. Oh, Hi, Magali. Hello, everyone. Hi, Heske. How are you? I figured it might actually be helpful if we raise our hands, right, so rather than just enter in, in and, and speak. So <laughs> I, yeah. I figured, let me try. And um, I actually really like this question about how, how should we define work because it touches on a lot of different things. And to me, it also seems quite related to the other question of how do we frame economics in a more people-oriented way rather than goods-oriented way. Because as, as Julie Nelson also comments, your job or what you do for work, it's for most of us, at least not for me <laughs> and why side, it's not really mostly about money. It's, it's about doing something that fulfills you um, and about yeah, uh, uh, pursuing values other than the classic maximization of utility in, in, the, in the traditional sense, right? So I think that, um, yeah, for, for me, that, that's how I would motivate that question as, a, as one that is, it, it's, it's a short and simple question, but it actually touches upon a lot of broad uh, themes. But um, I'm curious what other people think, and I'm curious how, how people think about that, that first question, about the people rather than goods-oriented um, one that we have on the list, which got a lot of likes. Maybe we like it so much that we don't want to rephrase, but I, uh, I think don't be shy. Let's, uh, let's see what we got. I think Dania is raising her hand. Would you like to take the floor, Dania? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I, my comment is actually on the same question Heske commented on, how should we define work? Um, so actually, I submitted the more narrow question, which I do believe now to be to be too narrow um, in light of Hesco's response. But I think what I was trying to get at is perhaps a paraphrasing of how should we define work to be something more inclusive and that comes across as a little bit less top down as if um, the way it's phrased now, it makes me feel like economists are trying to define work um, when in Julie's talk, she really inspired me to think about, oh yeah, what about asking people how they might do that? But I was struggling with the wording. So yeah, that was just my thought there. That's a great point. Uh, and if anyone would like to help on how can we collectively think about a wording that actually addresses it, I think this is a, a very important point. And, and something else that we should take into account is that we usually think about work as paid work. Um, and all of the discussions around how we define work tend to be very technical, uh, very oriented in terms of how we measure employment, for instance. Um, so perhaps we need uh, a definition that goes way beyond that and addresses some of the concerns that we um, are interested to study as social scientists. Um, let me see, anyone else willing to take the floor? This is, there's a lot to unpack on this question. So don't be shy, it could go in many directions. Oh, Lawrence, I see your hand is raised. Please take the floor. Thanks, Magali. I was just going to add that I feel like both of these questions are such million dollar questions. Uh, they're <laughs> fantastically firing and, and kind of get to such core points that I've, I'm finding it hard to suggest any, any edits and actually just rather wanting to kind of go and, and, and kind of get to the discussion point almost. So I think they're really, I think they're really great. Um, so that, that's just my feeling. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Uh, uh, we we sh we already have some new proposals. I'm gonna read them out loud. Um, how can we build on the shortcomings of the current economic understanding of work to make it more inclusive of people's lived experience? Oh, that's actually a really good one. I really like that one in the sense that I think it fully it encompasses many of the things that we have uh, discussed so far. Um, and we also have another one that says, how can work be redefined, which is perhaps more um, neutral in terms of the subject of that uh, definition, which also addresses uh, Dania's concern about um, who is the job subject of this. Anyone else would like to take the floor? It's a very interesting question. So as I said, we might, we could spend like the whole day in here. Remember that if you like the original questions, but now you see a rephrasing that you like better, you can just move around your like and choose a different one. Uh, of course, the, the, original, um, the original formulation always have an advantage. Oh yeah, and we have experienced some issues uh, with uh, the platform before. So if you're trying to push a rephrasing and it's not uh, coming through, please do let uh, Rebecca know or others know that you are trying to do that. And we might, uh, we might be able to help you with that. Oh no. Would you like to tell us, um, I see a comment on the chat box. Would you like to share why you like uh, rephrasing? I don't want to force anyone to take the floor if they're not willing, but it's really good to hear more voices in this debate. No, I just think that it fully incorporates what we were trying to talk about and what Julie also suggested. And yeah, I just think it works. That's great. Okay, we're soon moving to another question. So I was wondering if you'd like to share anything else before we do that. It's your last time. <laughs> Carlos, would you like to take the floor and share more about uh, that comment you made on the chat box? If not, it's okay. So I was suggesting in case you feel like Okay, well, we have uh, many, uh, many rephrasings that we can choose from. Uh, I'm not closing the option for now, so you have more time to think about it if you're unsure. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna go to a different uh, question, uh, which is the one that, uh, that reads, uh, how to incorporate interdisciplinarity in the economic sciences to overcome our methodological constraints? So we have, it's a very broad uh, question again. Uh, Julie chose to, on the one hand, give us some more practical advice, but also uh, some thoughts on how to do interdisciplinary work like in our everyday uh, life. We could also think about given more precise definition of what are these methodological constraints, or for instance, which kind of methodological constraints can be over, overcome by interdisciplinarity? Maybe some of them are not, um, cannot be overcome at all. So anyone willing to comment on this question could be on the original formulation as well. You don't have to propose a completely new formulation if you are satisfied with the current one. We don't want to fix what is not broken. <laughs> Perhaps we can reflect what are the methodological constraints that we see in economics today. And that could lead us to Okay, I see Lydia is raising her hand. Lydia? I just want to um, 
make a quick comment that I think I, I totally understand what Professor Judy uh, said to us that we should finish first our PhD and like make sure we complete our, um, you know, what we have to do. But I also have a feeling that it's, I mean, it's important that we, we push a little bit uh, our perspective into our, our professors, like, so they can consider it. I would just, uh, like, I mean, when I started, uh, I've always studied uh, working time, like, and productive working time. And when I told my supervisor, a man, that I was going to study working time, but also under a gender perspective, and because of that, I wanted to work with uh, non, uh, like, reproductive working time, non-paid working time. He was like, no, but why? We stud work. That's, that's not important. And I told him, look, well, you know, if, if, I, if I write a dissertation uh, saying that women work, it's only productive or it, it, without considering the time that we spent, like women spent on reproductive time, uh, then, then, you know, if there's any feminist in the, in the board, I'm going to fail. And then I slowly sort of drag him into <laughs> what I was thinking. And like now, now it's something that he considers. So I think we also can, uh, you know, of course, with respect and care for being careful, like, you know, maybe show um, our professors that the need of um, discussing feminist approaches or more inclusive approaches, I think that's, that's all I wanna share. Thank you, Ligia. That's uh, definitely a very interesting and important point. And also made me remember that uh, during the talk, I also thought uh, when she mentioned about how hard it is sometimes to get to a publication because how uh, academia mainstream structures are put in place, it also made me uh, maybe reflect on how uh, methodological constraints uh, relate to power imbalances in academia. So I think there's something there to unpack as well, how power relations operate in economic as a science. Anyone else willing to take the floor on this question? I think it's a really good one and it has a lot to, oh, we already have two, um, two rephrasing. So I'm gonna read them out loud. How can we incorporate interdisciplinarity in the economic sciences to overcome our methodological constraints? Uh, this is, I, I like this rephrasing in the sense that it's more reflective on our own practices, uh, which is really good. Um, and we also have, how can economics incorporate insights from other disciplines? That's a really good one as well. I think it also goes to the place of what is economics and what makes economics economics. <laughs> Uh, so to what extent can we incorporate things coming from other areas and other disciplines? Perhaps someone who suggested these formulations would like to explain the rationale behind, behind them. Nope, no takers. I also wonder if um, interdisciplinarity is all, only relevant in terms of overcoming our methodological constraints, or we can think about other ways in which we can benefit from borrowing, in a sense, from other disciplines that it's not only related to our methodological constraints, which perhaps this last formulation that reads uh, how can economics incorporate insights from other disciplines is broader in the sense that it acknowledges that we can um, benefit uh, from uh, those contributions, uh, even when they're not only in terms of methodological um, constraints.
Okay, I see a contribution related to the second question. Since we do have some time, I wouldn't mind, uh, Adina, if you'd like to take the floor and share. I mean, that would be okay if, if people would like to go back. Okay, regarding question two, which was the one about how can we define work or how we should define work. Um, we have a new contribution that says household chores uh, that don't directly contribute to the productivity, but still is necessary to be done, should be defined as work too. Well, it is by Fabian's economy, of course, defined as work, but it, the other question is also defined by whom, right? Um, and in under which uh, situation and for what purposes. It's not the same um, how we define work in our um, in our national service or in an academic paper. I mean, they are, are of course related, but they do have different consequences. Um, do you see a way, Adina, in that we can perhaps um, rephrase question number two, the one how should we define work that explicitly addresses the concern that you are mentioning? Or anyone else for that matter? Happy to receive contributions from others. It's all about building on each other's work. So so Carlos is asking if there is uh, a text-based answer graph where participants can answer questions on the question graph. Um, well, no, because the purpose is identifying the questions. We're trying to identify questions that cannot be replied by yes or no or a single paragraph, but that actually inspire our work. Um, so in the future, hopefully we can all get together and start uh, working and researching on uh, on the answers to these questions. But our first step is to identify all the right questions. And perhaps that's uh, actually my lead to go to the next and final part um, of, our, of our session here, which is choosing our favorites. Let me do that. Okay. So I just allow a new feature on the platform that is called favorites. So through favorites, which are these starts that appear uh, to the left or the questions, through the favorites, we're gonna identify the 100 most important research questions of our time. But unlike the likes, that is the hearts that we shall choose, stars or favorites are limited. You cannot choose 100 questions that you like the most. You can only choose 10. Um, however, fear do not, they are not um, set in stone. If you like 10 questions today and then you like a new question tomorrow, that is all right. We're just going to ask you to remove one of your previous uh, favorites or starts uh, in order to add a new start. So for now, um, you can go back um, to our platform and perhaps put a star on one of these questions. If you think one of these questions uh, is good enough to be among our most pressing 100 research questions of our time. And I really would like to hear if anyone thinks, if anyone is willing to put a star on any of them to think why uh, this is one of the most important questions. Anyone there? I think I'm gonna put a star on the one about interdisciplinarity because I think that as economists, we haven't given this question enough merit. And I think it's time for us to seriously uh, reflect on how can we benefit uh, from other. Oh, I see there's um, some suggestions in terms of of new rephrasing. Anyone else thinking about 
one of these questions being one of the most important 100 questions of our time? Okay, that's not a big problem. You still have many sessions and many opportunities to go back to the constellations, review all the questions and identify those questions that are most important for you. Um, not only for you personally, but most important for you, um, for your our collective work um, in the future. Oh, and I forgot to mention this, but all the questions that you choose as your favorites will be displayed on your Wi-Fi profile. So everyone that access your Wi-Fi profile will be able to see the questions that you feel uh, that are closer to your heart and that matters most to you. Okay, before we finish, anyone else willing to take the floor to say anything regarding this session? Okay, so thank you everyone uh, for being here. It was an amazing session. It was really interested. It's interesting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I'm gonna wrap up at this point. I'm gonna send you guys back to Thomas and I hope you see you soon. Bye.